This is Bruce Friedman of Adult Site Broker, and welcome to Adult Site Broker Talk, where each week we interview one of the movers and shakers of the adult industry, and we give you a tip on buying and selling websites. This week we'll be speaking with veteran producer Terry Stevens. At Adult Site Broker, we've doubled our affiliate payouts on ASB Cash. Now when you refer sellers or buyers to us, you'll receive 20% of our broker commission on any and all sales that result from that referral for life. You can either place a link to us on your site or refer buyers and sellers through an email introduction. ASB Cash is the first affiliate program for an adult website brokerage. Check out asbcash.com for more details and to sign up. We've also added an events section on our website at adultsitebroker.com. Now you can get information on B2B events on our site, as well as special discounts reserved for our clients. Go to adultsitebroker.com for more details. Now let's feature our property of the week that's for sale at Adult Site Broker. We're proud to offer an amazing opportunity. If you're in the live cams, model management, or fan site space, or want to get into them, we have a private listing that may be just right for you. This company works with all major cam sites and has access to hundreds of U.S.-based models. We're offering very limited information at the seller's request in order to maintain privacy. We anticipate multiple offers for this very rare listing. For more information, contact us at Adult Site Broker. Now time for this week's interview. My guest today on Adult Site Broker Talk is Terry Stevens, a.k.a. Naked Truth Guy. Terry, thanks for being back with us today on Adult Site Broker Talk. Hi, thanks for having me back again. It's a pleasure. Maverick producer Terry Stevens started out selling porn on VHS when the business was highly illegal in the mid-90s, before a chance encounter with a customer gave him the opportunity to, to make his first amateur movie. It was a couple of years later when he gained recognition as an amateur producer on the popular Viewers' Wives series from Your Choice in Holland, while still doing the round selling videos by mail order and door-to-door, got him raided. A two-year court case ensued. Meanwhile, Terry was gaining recognition with his new One-Eyed Jack Gonzo series of movies that earned him a seven-movie distribution deal to produce new movies for extreme associates in the U.S., But the company had problems of its own and stopped at five. Terry teamed up with a partner to launch Wrist Action Entertainment, a DVD distribution company supplying sex shops across the UK. The problems with the newfound industry gone legal had problems that required a concentrated effort, or I should say a concerted effort, to set standards, and UK adult producers was born from a chance gathering of producers to form an association under the name of Producers for a Pint. I like that. UCAP, as it came to be known later, was a collection of producers who engineered the much-needed changes that were required in a largely unregulated business, which later found itself defending the rights to produce adult content for sale in the UK and its numerous challenges from the R18 online, AT, VOD, and age verification while gaining momentum with his award-winning series, Real Couples, which was featured on Playboy's etc., and juggling with productions and daily politics with performers and his commitment to the association, as well as staying ahead of all the changes that come with the business in a constant state of flux. After years of being a secretary to the various administrations over a 10-year period, Terry became the default chairman for the full five-year term and oversaw the UCAP awards from 2014 to 2018. Since the pandemic, Terry has been living in Bulgaria and continues to monetize the business he created and promotes his website. So what's the difference, Terry, between Naked Truth Guy and Terry Stevens? Well, very big difference. Naked Truth Guy came about when I became more aware of the politics in this industry. So I I don't like to use the word mm-hmm. activist, but I, I think I did become more of an activist at one point in my career from 2015, sure. I think it was. 
Uh, it was uh, a guy mm-hmm. called Jerry Barnett who actually got me turned on to all this because one day he said to me, um, Gail Dines was coming to the UK and she was doing mm-hmm. a stop, was it a stop porn culture convention in London mm. where they were trying to get, because they, yeah. they already got porn banned in Iceland. So they were trying, so they mm-hmm. came over to the UK to continue their, their uh, campaign over here. And we just met with them as a sort of counter demo, if you like, because we felt that mm. if we didn't, if we didn't defend the porn, then left unopposed, they were going to make changes that, that the government were yeah. going to listen to. So, um, right. yeah, it was, it was interesting. I, I filmed that, that, that particular day and I realized that while I was having an, an opinion about it, I didn't want it affecting my day to day business. So um, Naked Truth sure. Guy came about when I started doing podcasts. Uh, the reasons why I did those podcasts in the beginning mm-hmm. was a simple way of reaching out to an audience rather than telling, because a lot of people would ask me what happened at the meetings, what happened here. And I thought, you know what, I'll just do a podcast mm-hmm. and that way you can listen to it because you know how it is. If you go into a meeting and, you, and everyone's expecting right. information from you, I've got to tell the same story 20, 20 or 30 times. I thought, hey, you know what? Just do a podcast. Just record it. Out it. There once. Yeah. <laughs> I think, listen to the podcast and then ask me questions from that. And that's how it kind of developed. You should have had recorded answers to play to them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I, I guess in the end, though, I did, though. I thought it was just a more of a practical way of getting the information across to uh, a lot of people because sure. I, I, sure. I was answering to a lot of people after the, who, who missed the meetings on the day. You yeah, know, as a result of that, though, um, as as we went forward, and I got more involved in the age verification, and and I, I I was starting to see a lot of things that were going on, and a lot of my opinions were formed from my observations of what was going on at these meetings, and uh, a lot of the times uh, I right. would vent my own opinion because I was chairman by default anyway. So I guess a lot of people were a little bit wary that mm. well, the chairman's got these opinions, but we don't agree with those opinions, you know. So they said to me, "You need <laughs> to have your own platform." So that's really one of the reasons why uh, Naked Truth Guy took hold. I mean, Naked Truth Guy really was a natural extension to the Naked Truth podcast, and the Naked Truth podcast came from an right. idea that the truth doesn't have to be dressed up. Ah. There it is. So, you know, it's interesting. You talk about anti-porn protests. I don't know. I thought we, we talked about this the first time, I think. Yeah. XBiz did one show in London. And there were, you might have been at that one. I'm not sure. They did several every year in London. I was at most of them. But did I they, think, did they do t- several yeah. in London? Okay, well. They, they did several. I think they started well, the, out well, the first in time. Yeah, it was the first. Yeah, the Europe show did start in London. I believe it was the first year in London where they had an anti-porn protest across the street, where there were a bunch of women and they I were know protesting. Where, I know what it was. It was at the Radisson Blue Hotel near T- Tottenham Court Road. Yes, and exactly. they were turning up exactly. in gas masks. Yeah, these protesters were turning up in gas masks and being a nuisance outside, weren't they? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I find and that that, that I, whole group just toxic. Well, look, they're they're getting stronger and stronger, unfortunately. And of course, they've got the religious right behind them, and they're getting really strong in the U.S. And that's that's something that you know the free speech coalition and others are trying to fight against. But it's they're kind of hard to fight against, you know. Trying to get politicians to say that they agree with porn is a little bit of a problem. Especially for them to come on record and say it. This is Naked Truth Guy's take on that. And from my own personal observation, I you found go. out that none of those organizations mm-hmm. would exist if they weren't well funded. The only reason why those guys and girls are anti porn is because they're getting paid. Um, I'll pick out Lila Micklewaite from mm-hmm. Exodus Cry. She's making millions mm-hmm. of, uh, from the knee jerk reactions of parents sure. who are frightened of porn. Right. And they feel that Lila Micklewaite yep. is going to be the savior to bring down the whole porn industry. She will never, ever succeed. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason why they'll never, mm-hmm. ever ban porn because there has to be a whipping post for these politicians to <laughs> mount their agendas on. And porn is the That's perfect point. platform. It is. It, it, I mean, I've heard that the porn industry is the bastard child of Hollywood. So in other words, we're, gonna, we're going to be, <laughs> always exist 
Paul will always prevail. A, yeah. a, a, a mainstream producer told me that. A mainstream producer friend told me this. Yeah, he said Paul will always prevail. He said, really? no matter, have they tried to? Yeah, if they tried to mm. ban it. Somehow, the porn industry will find a way of thriving. Well, we're we're strong. We're strong, and we're we're oh, stronger we're together. We're, no, no we're resilient. That's the thing. We can take a kick. Very, very, yeah, exactly. So, what can we learn about the past in our industry, and where can we find information about that? That's a very good question. The interesting thing about that question is you have to remember that history is constantly repeating itself. This industry is constantly mm -hmm. evolving. When I say it's in a state of flux, I mean that it's just constantly just evolving. One way or another, it's it's moving forward. But for every two steps forward, you, mm -hmm. you take you always seem to take about three steps back. You know, somebody's trying to hold us back. What we're experiencing today with Exodus Cry is probably no different from the Mies Commission. And then before that, you had yeah. um, there were other censorship things like to do with other noted names back in the day. What's her name? Candida Royal, who you know, who's a, who's a female producer who was an activist so you know female producers are nothing new to the industry mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to make it look today that you know mm -hmm. women are subjugated to men's gaze and fantasies well you know, they are <laughs> they are but right. at the same time women are also empowered <laughs> to, to make the kind of porn that they want to make now there's a there's a lot more women making porn as a matter of fact if you yes. look at things like uh, only yes. fans everyone's become independent now i mean technology mm -hmm. has now democratize the yes. industry to the point where everyone who wants to make yeah. porn can make porn now. So there's no one being oppressed. There's no female right. being oppressed. They're all in it by choice, mm -hmm. whatever their motives are. That's right. Mostly the motives are to make money. Absolutely. And, you know, during the pandemic, as everybody noted, there was a, a huge groundswell of new people coming into the industry that would have never considered doing porn, but they... I wouldn't say they were forced to do it. Oh, no sure. one's ever forced to do anything. But I think they considered that, well, if they can yeah. make a good living and, and get out of this, you know, they're, they're going to be spending a lot of time at home. Yeah. Why not? You're right. And a lot of people, I think, needed OnlyFans to eat during the pandemic. Yes, totally. What do you think the likes of OnlyFans will do and is doing to the, the rest of the industry? Right now, I don't think – I mean, OnlyFans is popular, as we know, as a platform. But at the moment, there's a lot of heavy criticism against it because they haven't paid any lip service sure. to their their sex worker contingent. Now, I understand why they do this, to be honest, because if you understand how the payment processes work, they could never – Mm -hmm. acknowledge the sex worker side because that area was considered mm -hmm. toxic for banking practices. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that as well, a lot of people may not know this, but OnlyFans is also monitored and moderated or regulated, what should I say, by Ofcom, which is the uh, watchdog for mm -hmm. re regulating the internet in the UK. Well, actually regulating the media generally. Interesting. All I didn't these know city that. rules, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, there's a there's a, a government quango. They may not class themselves as a government quango, but mm -hmm. if you know a, what a quango is, it's a it's a job that's been created to create a body of people who will comply by the law uh, of what's legal and what isn't mm -hmm. legal. And again, what is mm -hmm. legal written on the statute is sometimes subject to interpretation. You know, things like uh, squirting, they won't allow squirting. So what's happened now? You're going to see a load of people, a load of, mm -hmm. load of girls migrating to the other platform, and another platform that's offshore, like something like Fansly, which I believe mm -hmm. is American, right? right. Is American or Canadian? I'm not sure. It's somewhere that, that side of the, 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 the world. But where censorship is a bit more relaxed there. That, it's, it's, that it's, one I'm it's not strange. sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, w I would say censorship's a lot more relaxed in the US. And sometimes if you speak to an American, they don't feel it's relaxed. But in terms of what they can do with content. So far. Yeah, uh, for the sake of the, the, this conversation, yeah, they'll move to a platform where they where the, the laws are a little bit more relaxed than in the UK. Interesting. So how do you, when we're talking about the past in the industry, how do you ask the right questions to get the proper answers. 
this is uh, that's an interesting one because you really need, need to know what you're talking about first before you can ask the right kind of questions. And more often than not, people will right. always always ask the questions like, "How do you get into the business?" Now that's an interesting question in itself mm-hmm. because I would say, well, these days I right. start up an OnlyFans account, but that's there's more to it than that <laughs> because there's a whole load right. more to it than that. You know, then you've got to tell them that well, if you're going to be working with somebody else, you know, you've got to get tested. Then you've got to get tested to a certain profile, you know, because then you've got to tell them that you're in the adult industry so that they know what profile to test you for. Uh, then you're going to need three months of tests right. before you – I mean, this doesn't apply to everybody. I mean, some people might just go for a 14-day test uh, and, you know, they accept a 14-day test and they're happy mm-hmm. with that. But everyone's different. Yeah, I think you can sure. write a bloody book <laughs> on, on how to get into the industry because there's so many things now. I mean, the easiest way to do it is to really set up, set up your own self with an OnlyFans account, but then you've got to find other people to work with. Mm-hmm. And then you've got to know the, the etiquette yeah. of dealing with people to work with. To answer the right questions, you really need to learn a little bit about the industry first. Um, and I, I do think there, there should be yes. some kind of an induction process to the business. When people come in, there should be like... I uh, agree. Yeah. Like uh, the there should be adult a... Adult like university. A <laughs> well, do you know what the weird thing is in terms of university? I believe somebody like Rocco Sofredi is already doing something like that in Italy. I mean, he's got a program about his, his porn university. Really? Have you seen it? Yeah, it's brilliant. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. it's interesting because he's got a load of guys yeah, staying, staying on campus. They all stay on campus, and he's got these about six to eight porn stars, yeah, who service their needs. So mm-hmm. if Rocco's educating mm-hmm. these chaps about how to, how to start a scene, <laughs> he teaches them first that they have to be confident. Interesting. So, Rocco. yeah, there's a whole process, so who, but there's a whole who else, process right? to it. Who else? Yeah, well, Rocco is a uh. legend, Denny, really. But, you know, but you know what, what, what mm-hmm. upsets me more about Rocco doing that is that I had that idea 10 years before and I was ridiculed for it. It's like porn university. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Can't stop it, Terry. Yeah, you didn't know. Yeah, you you yeah, you didn't know what you were talking about, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah. What do I know? You know, and everything that I everything that I talk about has come from my experience and observation of this industry. And I always feel that for every problem we yes. got, there is a solution. And there's a practical solution. So yeah. I would say to people, look, if you if sure. you want to ask me, because I've been told when I was chairman of UCAP, there were certain people that said to me. Oh, we we didn't learn anything from being with you. Yeah. And I thought, what do you mean? I said, well, everything you told us was wrong. And I thought, well, maybe because you was asking the wrong questions. (laughs) But then I would say, on the contrary, I think you've learned a lot. You've learned not how to do it now. (laughs) That's the thing. I said, what works for me may not necessarily work for you. That's the thing. I came from a different era. I said, I came I came from a period where we were creating this stuff. We were creating the platform. We Correct. were setting, you know, we had That's to right. go up against the, these various factions that were thrown at us, yeah, over the years, you know, uh, with the yeah. BBFC, the R18 yeah. online, the ATVOD, mm-hmm. you know, the government thing. And, and, and I remember distinctly people said, oh, that's it, well, the game's over, the, uh, the porn's going to be banned, you can't fight against the government. I said, it's not about fighting against the government. It's about opposing the government and slowing the process down so we can have a discussion Correct. about this. Correct. Yes. The one thing I've yes, learned the about old the saying, government. The old saying, you, you, can't, you can't fight City Hall, you know, but you can fight City Hall. Yes, you can, yeah. And, wh- and what you do is that you oppose their next bill or you oppose something that's coming through and they want to know who's opposing it. And I found that right. the government, when we've, we've actually been to um, – to Whitehall, down to uh, central London. And I've been in Parliament as well, was invited mm-hmm. to Parliament through mm-hmm. uh, Chris Ratcliffe at TVX. Yeah. And, you know, we had a chance to have a chat with various people. And we found that a lot of the times, the government really do have bigger fish to fry than deal with porn. And they do tell us that they have to be seen to be Hello. doing something. <laughs> I think what you find is that the people that are driving it, the driving the government to do these things, are the people like uh, the NSPCC, mm-hmm. you know, the National Society mm-hmm. for Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Yeah, so they're driven by their remit, if you like, to protect children on the internet. Yeah, They don't care how it's done, they just want it right. done. And that's the thing, because they don't know nothing about the industry. Well, and... Yeah, yeah, they just they, d- they just assume yeah. we're but we're a bunch we're a bunch of pedophiles. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah, Bruce, I did try to reach out to them, 
But, you know, um, they just weren't interested. They just didn't mm-hmm. even respond back. So I thought, well, do you know what? We, we had good suggestions yep. to put forward on how to protect children online. But right. hey, if you don't want to hear it, what can we do? Well, and that would be the that would be the response I would expect. So what are your thoughts on using social media platforms for promotion? And what do you think people in our industry need to know about them? Well, social media platforms. First things first, okay, technically we're all breaking the law. Just use them. The moment we're, we're advertising adult content and we're putting mm-hmm. naughty images on there, we're breaking the terms of service. Yep. But, you know, interesting, sure. we're, 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 we're breaking it on mass to the point they're just looking the other way now. They just, I think they just couldn't be bothered. That's what, look, okay, look, yeah. we told them not to put porn on it, but now we're, we're swamped with porn. Okay, so we're going to have to yep. deal with this another way. Now, what people need to realize, I, I think if, if you follow the rules to, to a degree, that, that there's, um, I think that they are a little bit lenient when they say, okay, look, if you're going to do this, do it in your timeline, but don't put it on your main display. Yeah, uh, keep keep that friendly mm. because that's the first port of call that everybody makes when they go onto Twitter and they see all your all, all everybody who signed up. They don't Correct. want to be looking at porn. So I I agree with that. I think that's great. I think you shouldn't yeah. put porn in your main display. Yep. Uh, you could put it. You can you can mention it in your bio. But they but do don't put hardcore. But yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, but you, but also yeah. what what everyone needs to remember <laughs> is that every time you are thrown off that goddamn platform, you have to remember that you're just a guest here on someone else's platform. This is a private run organization, so you don't really have any recourse True. to fight back. People, uh, I see people saying that they're going to take yeah. uh, take these people to court. You know, uh, take legal action against them, class actions against yeah. them Good for luck. what? Good yeah, luck. it's their business. You know, right. they, they don't have to be told what to do. You're just a guest here, you know. I'm just a guest here. So if they decided that they, you know, we don't like you, we yeah. don't like what you do, we could just throw you off. And that goes for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, the whole lot of them. They're all private right. organizations. Right. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, you know, Facebook threw me off for the last time, and mm-hmm. I didn't violate any terms and conditions, but their AI thinks I did, so I'm out. And I just finally said, you know what? It's just not worth it. I mean, there is B2B value, and that's mm-hmm. what I deal in. Yeah. But to be honest with you, I just got tired of the the dance, and that's okay. There are other fish to fry, so it's all good. It's all I good. It's I'm emphasizing thing, Twitter it? more. I got thrown off LinkedIn, and I, I went back on there. Unfortunately, I lost my 5,000 contacts or so, and I'm slowly rebuilding it, but Oh, well, it is what it is, right? Yeah, well, there's not a hell of a lot that, you can do about it. Yeah. Bruce, so this is the thing about that. Um, I think that we should stop being slaves to social media. And again, these are things that we can learn from the past. Yeah. What did we do before Twitter? What did we do before yeah. social media? Yeah, how did, I mean, back in the True. early days when I was when I was a successful private distributor of illegal movies, mm. I had a mailing list. <laughs> and what I did, I traded those mailing lists with other people who had mailing lists. And before long, sure. those mailing lists became bargainable by, by, by being paid for. So people would pay for mailing lists. Sure. I mean, you'd pay for, oh, like, yeah. I, I mean, a hundred, a hundred quid for 5,000 names. Cause yep. that's worth money to you. So yeah, back in the old days before social media, I remember. Yeah. That's how people worked. So we can look to oh, the I past know. again. I know. That's, a, that's another perfect example of looking to the past. To, to deal with um, problems mm-hmm. in the present. That's true. Yep, email is still a thing. Yeah. Some people don't believe that, but it works extremely well for me. Uh, yeah. Do you think the adult business needs to take accountability for things it's criticized for, like supposed unrealistic depictions of sex and relationships? Mm, well, I'm going to say a yes and a no to that. The yes part of it would be, I would think, if you're making something particularly uh, risky, because it's all fantasy. So, I mean, my argument to the no would be because it's fantasy, we don't have to hold ourselves accountable. Mm-hmm. You're, you're over the age of 18 when you watch this, so you should have a, you should have a good mindset to know what right and right. wrong is. Uh, but the yes side of that is... You should. Yeah, the, yeah, I would say so. I would say that, you know, to put a disclaimer on it, follow the mainstream rule, you know, when in doubt, just put a disclaimer on it and just say, look, these are performers or whatever, 
in a in a fantasy situation. <laughs> do, do not copy this at home. Right. <laughs> These things are performed by professionals. Don't, try, don't yeah. do not try this at home. Exactly. exactly. That's, exactly. it. That's the one. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, don't forget, we we in the adult industry, we do weird uh, acrobatic positions. We're over the top. It's over the top theatrics. It's like one of the things I argue about uh, right. in defense of extreme porn is that when I hear that a girl's been abused, I look at her crying, her makeup is running, that she's been slapped up. What they don't understand is I know some of those girls who get slapped up and they love it. And I said, but it's because mm. they enjoy what they do. Yeah, I, th- I say, look, if anybody yeah. has got a problem with what they do, they could just immediately stop. Yeah, but yeah, you're hearing all it. these arguments. Yeah, exactly. You hear all these. But also, the other thing I yeah. would say is that a lot of the girls should do their research before agreeing to doing jobs. I don't know if they – personally, I think a lot of them do. But, you know, I'm just saying mm-hmm. it for the cheap seats because I do think a lot of people do know that if they're going to be working for a certain sp- a producer who's known – for um, pushing the envelope with their performances, uh, that they would know that beforehand, yep. you know. And if and, and, exactly. if, you, but, and exactly. if you want to, if you if you don't want to be worked hard like that, and you just want to do straightforward vanilla, there's plenty of producers out there who do straightforward vanilla. There's really, I mean, I don't agree with um, a, a lot of things, but at the same time, I would say that if, I think it's unprofessional for when the industry has to call out another person for their practices. They should know, if they're going to be doing extreme porn, they should know the rules and limitations of what they do. That's true. No, that's very true. So what do you think about so-called porn addiction being a national emergency in both your home country and in mine? Do you feel a sense of responsibility for those who are supposed victims of it? Well, for one, I don't believe in porn addiction at all. I mean, I've... I've been jerking off for 30 years. I ain't got no mm-hmm. problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, seriously. No, seriously. No, I don't agree. I thought it was. I don't agree with porn addiction. I I mean, I, I've never yeah. seen anybody frothing at the mouth needing to masturbate over pornography, ever. Yeah? Mm. I think you have to ask yourself this. I think por- you could learn a lot about yourself watching porn. If you really need porn right. that much, yeah, and it's, and it's affecting your daily life, well, the porn's doing all right. Mm-hmm. It's just the, the problem is just the end user. So I would say to you, you need True. to find, be honest with yourself and say, if you have a problem, it's not the porn, it's you. Yeah. What, what, what is it that porn provides that you, you're not getting? I mean, do you need a girlfriend? Right. Some people, there's there's a whole new group of people coming up called pornosexuals who actually dedicate their lives to masturbating. Mm-hmm. That's what they want to do, and if that's right. what they want to do, then let them be. Yeah. I mean, I did do I did do a podcast. Well, you, I, I did, well you've also you've also heard about you've heard about incels, right? Y- yes, I have. Yeah, they're, they're, these these guys are angry at women uh, because you know, right. yeah, they're angry at women for a variety of women. And, uh, yeah. So they're, they're like the next level misogynists, aren't they? Really? That they just hate women a lot. No, mainly they? because so. they're not getting laid. Have you seen the state? Uh, of someone? They don't deserve yeah. to get laid. If they had a shower and a shave, <laughs> you know, and had a bit of personality, exactly. you know, it doesn't take much sex. Women like sex as much as men. So, you know, and, and, <laughs> I, I just don't. I just don't, when I when I hear a guy <laughs> hates women, and and I think, well, dude, you know, fix up a little bit. You know, you, you don't look too bad. You just look like you need a good wash. <laughs> I mean, come on, girls. Girls are into nice smells and you know, and decent looking right. guys. You don't. You don't have to have a six pack to be with a nice girl. True. And by the way, you know, you mentioned the the fault is not the porn; it's the person. I think the same thing goes for drugs. It's not the crack's fault. It's your fault that exactly. you get addicted crack, from it. Exactly. Crack is doing what crack does. You know, it's just being crack. You know, it's the end that's user right. that's, that, that has exactly. exactly. And it's the end user that's responsible. The other thing as well, uh, lots of bringing the whole sex and violence thing. You know, does porn is porn responsible for men being violent? No, it isn't. Because when when they use that excuse, they're mm-hmm. taking away the blame. They're taking away the accountability from the rapist. Right. So they're saying, oh, right. oh, oh, that, that no, poor rapist, he was, he was a slave to the porn. This is why he did what he did. No, he's a rapist. Yeah. You know, it's nothing to do with porn. Actually, uh, actually, porn 
and prostitution probably prevent more rapes than they they cause by by a wide margin. Exactly. I mean, I, this, this, I mean, there's a porn producer turned comedian who actually uses this uh, line in his movie uh, in his in his uh, stand up routine, and he said. Uh, that uh, porn doesn't cause people to rape because he said that after you've had a good wank, you, you don't want to do anything else. <laughs> well, it's true, isn't it? Yeah, after you've had exactly. a wank, you know, you, I was you, just, you haven't got the energy yes, to do anything yes, else. I was just thinking that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You're not going to rape. You're not going to rape anyone after jerking off, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no offense, but it might be in any of your mind before. <laughs> but if you watch the porn movie, you think, I can't be bothered now. <laughs> I've calmed down now. I'm all right. <laughs> so there seems to be some abuse going on in the business, obviously, yep. with performers. I mm -hmm. uh, alluded to it a little bit in the last question. And right after you, I'm going to be speaking with Leanne Young, allegedly one of uh, Ron Jeremy's victims. What Ooh. are your thoughts on how to deal with this? Uh, well, having dealt with it organically as a chairman, now this isn't the popular opinion but this is my opinion from observation. I would always say, if this is really serious, go and file an official report with the police. And I've heard, normally heard that the police can't do anything. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's fine. The police can't do nothing. That's great. But I said, you go and file that official report because right there and then, once it's official, I will have to act on that. My decisions will be based on the fact that you filed a report. Until you do that, that she said stuff. Because what's going to happen is, you say yeah. this to me, I've got to hear the other guy's side of the... And you say, no, it didn't turn out like that at all. Now, I have been involved with something right. like, between two friends. One was a female, one was a male. And I, the, the girl told me that mm -hmm. that person was quite rough with her. And I thought, do you know what? Well, that guy's a friend of mine. I'm going to have a word with him. I had a word with him. And he said, well, that's not what she said in the day. I thought everything was fine. And I thought, okay. So when I told her <laughs> that he said that, she had a go at me and blocked me on social media. I thought, never again. Mm -hmm. Don't get involved. I said, in yeah. future, we're going to do yeah. this by the book. You will file an official report, yep. and then I will decide that. Okay. Yeah. Do you know no, what? She's filed a report against you. So agreed. if there's any events, because most times if they wanted somebody banned from a, a particular event I was running at the time. And I said that, well, it's a bit difficult mm -hmm. because – we're just playing he said, she said stuff now. So when people say, oh, yeah, that, that, yeah. that particular yeah. person has abused me, why are they at this event? Why are they being chosen for this? Why are they, why are they a member of this? I said, because it's all hearsay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, until it's right. actual put into right. an official report, then it's official. Yeah. yeah. You make a good point. So, Terry, what would you suggest performers do to protect themselves from potential abuse? First and foremost, I would suggest that they do their homework on the person that they're going to work with uh, by seeing their work and also by agreeing beforehand what their limitations are in terms of what they're willing to do performance-wise. Also, but also, on the other hand, though, I know this could swing the other way around for producers, and I've been educating producers for years, uh, that they should have one camera filmed wide of the whole proceedings, everything from the moment they turn up, you're in this room to the, to the end when they leave. I mean, I, I used That's to good. use it for my, for my behind the scenes. It was never used for this particular sort of thing, mm -hmm. but it was just used specifically because I, I was always fascinated by the things that we talked about on the day. And I always used to look at myself and how I was mm -hmm. directing mm -hmm. people, talking to people. And also I've never been called sure. upon to sure. look at old footage. But, you know, uh, in case you have to reference, mm -hmm. say something happened on the day and there was some misunderstanding between both parties, you could refer back to that tape and say, look, right. I, we didn't talk about it. You could see on the tape that we didn't talk about that. So right. I would say that, yeah, have a third camera, camera set up to record sound uh, and in wide, uh, uh, wide covering all the action with the doors and everything, people coming in and out mm -hmm. um, so that you um, – mm -hmm. I've got that for a reference, just in case. And keep it on file. You just never know when you might need it. And and, yeah. and like I said, you know, you can use it for behind. Yeah, the it's like a it's like a security camera for sure. Pretty much, sure. yeah, yeah. So, what's your take on performers leaving the business and then requesting their content be taken down? Uh, I've encountered that. Uh, it's annoying because 
it, I don't see the point in taking content down like 10 years later after it's already been on the internet and, lo- and thousands of people have already downloaded it. And I say to people, look, you know, I always ask them first, where did they first see it? And in nine times out of 10, it's going to be on some tube site somewhere, some obscure tube site. Yeah, they sure, obviously sure. bought it from my site, yes. But I can't be held accountable for what people do with the footage after they have bought it. I don't know everybody who buys these things. I don't forget right. I'm a shop window. I'm selling content. I don't know who these people are that are buying it. Yeah. So they decide right. to exploit it in ways that right. they want to. You know, um, so I would say to people, right. yeah, don't forget you. When you uh, not only that, read the model release because, unlike a lot of people, I, it's about the terminology mm-hmm. and the words I use. You know, I do own the content in perpetuity, mm-hmm. and it is at my discretion whether I want to take it down or not. You know, if, it's not my yeah. fault if you decide not to read the agreement that you signed. And they ask me, can I have a copy of it? Yeah, yeah. I still got a copy of it after all these years, and uh, their, their photo ID, and sure. they've agreed to it. There's nine times out of ten, they just sign it and just snatch mm-hmm. the money and run. <laughs> you know, what can I do? Yeah, of course. Why do you think there's limited interest in supporting organizations that defend the business from banking discrimination and terms of use violations? I think that's mainly down to a lot of people are just focused on the money at the moment. I think it's a case of making hay while the sun shines. Uh, most people w- won't are not interested mm. enough in the business to know what the what they're doing was once illegal, so they don't know the rules of having to do this properly. And some people don't even see it as a business. That's another thing. Sure. A lot of people coming into the business right now do yeah. not see it as a business. It's just a, a payday yeah. and an opportunity to get laid. And I think that's the real problem. Yeah. You've got about ninety percent of the industry is that way at the moment. The ten percent who I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have put a percentage in it. I don't know for a fact what, what the percentage is, but I'd say you get the picture, though, that it's a small minority of people who are dedicated to this business as a business. So they're the ones that are going to be investing mm-hmm. interest in organizations that will protect their business. Yep. If you don't, if you don't consider it a business, then you're not going to treat it that way. Exactly. And I think a lot of people, they're making a lot of money right now and I think I was guilty of this once when I came into the business because I didn't know much about I knew that what I was getting into was illegal. And I did read – that's the thing. I did read mm. up on a lot of it because I knew if it was illegal, what, what, mm. what would be my course of action? What what would bury me quick? What would they go for me quick to, to get a, a secure, yeah. quick conviction? Yeah. And I decided straight away, pay my sure. tax. Yeah, because once I pay my tax, I know yeah. that I've got a le- <laughs> I've got, <laughs> I've got a bit of leverage. I say, oh, I'll work for the government. See, look, I'll pay my taxes. Sure. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. you know, yeah. and true to and true to form, I, the day uh, I was it's raided, always, it's always about money. Yeah, and true to form, the day yeah. I got raided, I had loads of cash lying around the house. You know, because you know how it is. Ah, I'm King Midas, mate. Everything I touch turns to gold. There's money everywhere. So the police all oh, scooped shit. it all up, Lovely. put it all on the table, counted it all out. Yeah. And they said, Evidence. "You are aware we found, yeah, we found this amount of money." Blah blah blah. I got the money back in the end, though. That's the thing. But they made it clear that they found all this money. They counted it all out, and they got me to sign off on it, and they put it in a plastic nice. bag, and that it was all done properly. Nice. So, um, yeah. That's fantastic. We keep getting new banking regulations. What do you think we can expect next? Right. There's been a lot of silence. There's been silence for a long time now since they've brought the regulations in. And the regulations meant that all these websites, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, it's been quiet for a while now. This is what I expect. I don't know if this is an actual fact, but this is what I'm going to expect next. Because it's been quiet, mm-hmm. I will call, we, we used to know this as a grace period. So in other words, I'll say you've got 12 months <laughs> to get your paperwork in order, all your paperwork, all your model releases, your IDs, and get them ready for every single scene you've got on your site. And you think, okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now everyone's thinking, after all that, you never heard nothing from the banks. So it's like, oh, this is not the, this right. is not the time to get relaxed about it. This is a time to wonder when they're <laughs> going to start playing eeny, meeny, miny, yeah. moe. Because what they're going to do next, I can see, yep. is that they're going to pick on sites and do a random audit. And they're going to expect to lose people and make an example of those people they lose. <laughs> and they'll do it without impunity. They'll give you – uh, don't get me wrong. They'll, yeah. uh, they'll probably give you 14 days to get your house in order. Oh, you haven't got your paperwork. Well, you've got 14 days to get that in order. If you don't get that in order, you're gone. 
we're going to lose you as a uh, MasterCard fees are going to yeah. lose you as a as a customer. Yeah, there's no return, mm-hmm. no, no matter what yeah. you do, because you can't be trusted. You're not a valued customer. Yep. And you're high risk. Yeah, and they'll just do that randomly. Yep. And I think they'll, but well, like I said, they won't be uh, ruthless about it. They'll give you a period to sort yourself out. Oh, you didn't take us serious the first time. Okay, we give you 14 days to get yourself sorted. And if you don't, they'll just lose you. And when they lose yeah. you, they'll work. They'll weigh up the statistics because they have to be seen to be doing oh, something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sure it won't be their largest uh, customer. Yeah, I think they will pick pick on the boutique sites. I think they'll pick on the smaller sites because they're expecting that's where the problem's going to be. Because the yeah, bigger sites, because the big know, boy, the big boys have more more to lose. Not only that, the big boys. Uh, I mean, I know one of the biggest names we could name in the, right now uh, have been more vigilant in their paperwork since day one. When I say they were vigilant on their paperwork, they were oh, vigilant yeah. on their own paperwork for their own producers. It's a shame they just didn't use it for the right. user-generated crowd. Mm-hmm. And what I predicted in right. 2007 sure. has actually come to come to fruition now. It's just weird. I, I did bring this up yeah. uh, on XPIS um, yeah. recently, and people did say, yeah, do you know what? Yeah, you're right. I said, yeah, but you did say it was right at the time. You was all saying that this Article 230, is it was it Clause 230, <laughs> they're all protected uh, by that. Uh, you're full of shit. Yeah, yeah you're full exactly. of shit. So you're certainly in favor of uh, having clean and clear 2257 and all of that um, ready Absolutely. just in case. Absolutely. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, you know, you, I mean, if you don't have these things, even back in back before the debacle started, you could have been accused of revenge porn. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. You're putting um, yep. uh, intimate content online without permission. It's the same well, thing. Not only revenge porn, and I, I want to apologize to everybody because we've got a little time lapse here, and I, I've never had that happen uh, with this platform before, but I'm certainly going to let them know about it. But, yeah, um, yeah I mean, not only that, people can be um, also um, accused of kitty porn. Yes. Yeah, this, this is another thing. If a girl looks particularly of that type, like, you know, she's a, a shy teen waif, you know, she decides that she wants to get you back. She could say, well, I was uh, underage when I did that video, so you better take it down. Exactly. So what problems can producers expect from the business these days? Oh, these days it's the OnlyFans era now. This is where the content creators run things. So, yeah, the producers mm-hmm. are going to have uh, all kinds of problems now. They're going to have people not even wanting to work. Back in the old days, you know, people wanted right. to work and they, they were ringing you up looking for work. Nowadays, they just can't be bothered. I mean, sometimes they can't even be bothered to work for themselves. Yeah. That's how relaxed they are. They don't, have to, they don't have to leave the house, so why should well, they bother? Look, if you're making that kind of money, what the hell, right? Yeah, that's the kind of problem you're going to get. A lot of uh, lack of professionalism. And, yeah, yes. it's just going to create a bit of a problem for the more bespoke producer who – you know, who might have to get a model costume fitted for that special fetish shoot, uh, but find themselves wasting money on productions mm-hmm. because the model just doesn't even turn up on the day. Gee, that's never happened before. Well, yeah, I mean, we've always <laughs> had no shows, but you know, the great thing about in Hollywood, when they get no shows, they just sue the arse off them. I mean, you just look at big celebrities like right. Kim Bassinger when she did that, when she didn't turn up for the Boxing Helena film, she got sued. And guess what? She ended up broke mm-hmm. bankrupt. But you can't do yeah. we, we can't do that's that right. in the adult industry, can we? It's a damn shame. It's a it's a damn shame because there are some that certainly have done things to warrant that. But I think everyone is just so casual about it because it's like they just figure a certain percentage aren't going to show up, so they you know the producers roll with it. Well, yeah, I, I think that's, that's what it is now. You've just got to roll with it or just find a community of people that you really like to work with. I mean, I think the future is there already with uh, the way things are going now. I mean, some uh, performers mm-hmm. now have got the money to turn it around and hire the producer now to work for them, you know, like shooting yes. and editing yes. and taking pictures. But uh, at the same time, I, I can see mm. the, the industry is turning turning around in terms of that and it's nice to see that there are some performers out there who are professional enough to realize that hey do you know what i'm gonna make the step from being a performer not just a content creator but you've got content creators should see themselves as producers now so they just they should really learn the art of producing 
adult content and distribution uh, instead of just relying on a platform like OnlyFans because they have to look at it this way. OnlyFans, sure. just like anything else, is, is part of a fast-moving world. And something could change in five years. I mean, we've seen already the, the kind of controversial blips with um, OnlyFans where they were threatening to go mainstream and they wanted mm-hmm. to take hardcore yeah. porn off their site. And then within 48 hours, they're like, oh, oh we made a mistake. Uh, let's, let's, let's reverse that because they suddenly realized that there's something we were, else waiting. Yeah, we there's were another only, platform waiting for them. Yeah, we were, only, we were only kidding. So what's in the future for Terry Stevens, Naked Truth Guy, one or the other or both? Um, Naked Truth Guy is doing all right on social media, still getting involved with <laughs> disputes and issues and whatnot. I like to, I like to keep my, um, my awe in there somewhere just to keep my, uh, my teeth <laughs> sharpened, if you like. But at the moment, I'm there you go. putting together all my information from the past 30 years. And thankfully, I've written diaries as well for shoots, uh, that I can fall back on to help put my memoirs together. I've got so much information from our memoir. Ah. I was thinking about making it a trilogy, <laughs> a three-part book. Oh, wow. A three-part book? Well, three, wow. three, well, three book That's or whatever. You know what I mean? Cool. Yeah. That's extremely cool. So that, that's what I'm working on at the moment. But I've also got several features uh, that I shot for in the past 10 years that I need to put together now. One of them was a documentary, a personal documentary about the industry, which covered a lot of mm-hmm. uh, topics that you don't really see in mainstream films and programs. Uh, luckily, uh, sure. these were people that really wanted to say what they really felt because they did say to me, well, if you're agreeing to do this, Terry, can I say what I want, what I really feel about the industry? And I said, absolutely. I said, this is a personal cool. film. Cool. I said, I, I'd, I'd like to examine the, 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 complex act, the, the complex relationship that we have with pornography as well. That's neat. Um, yeah, uh, Todd Spates from Yanks Cash uh, has a memoir coming out too. Mm-hmm. That's going to be really cool. I don't know if you know if you know of Todd, but uh, I, I, it's something that everyone in the in the business will enjoy. Well, do you know? I think most people in the business have an interesting story to tell, and I think it's worth reading most of them because they're all coming from different angles. I mean, mm-hmm. I know there's certain traits and similarities that we might have had like some people might have had a poor background yeah we know the rags to riches stories and stuff but what's most mm-hmm. important is why do they get into porn mm-hmm. and their relationship with the business and porn and and with themselves because i think one of the right. biggest things I've, i'm right. drawn to Absolutely. this industry about and it took me a while to observe this because i think it's not about the money i was making money before i even got into this business but i think it was like, i thought what's drawn me to this industry and i realized what it was it's it was just human psychology. The human aspect of it really drew me in. Yeah, that's cool, man. That's really cool. Well, hey, Terry, I'm, I'm looking forward to the book. I'm expecting an autographed copy. Um, yeah. I'd like to thank you for being our guest today, again, on Adult yeah. Site Broker Talk. And I hope we'll get a chance to do this again soon, maybe when the book comes out. Yeah, that'd be a good thing. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on board today. Hey, man, it's always fun. Thank you. My broker tip today is part five of what to do to make your site more valuable for when you decide to sell it later. Last week, we talked about new ways to monetize your site. Next, eliminate unneeded expenses. Constantly make sure you're not spending money you don't need to. Make sure there isn't duplication in your staffing. From time to time, check services you pay for like hosting and see if there are better and less expensive options. Take it from me. I've done this and saved a bunch, plus I've gotten higher quality hosting in the process. Again, ask us for recommendations. Always look for ways to do things more cost effectively. Along with this, make your profit and loss statements show more profit. Increasing sales and reducing expenses obviously does just that. Make sure your P&L statement accurately reflects your company's actual costs, not a bunch of personal expenses you've put in. This will cost you money when you sell. It may help you with the tax man to put that stuff on your tax return, but it hurts you if you show that stuff on your profit and loss statement. Remember, 
Every dollar in profit increases the value of your website as much as three to four times. This is why you need a good, experienced broker to help lead you through the process. We've gotten people thousands of dollars more on their sale just by adjusting the P&L statement to reflect actual business expenses as opposed to a bunch of BS. We'll talk about this subject more next week. And next week we'll be speaking with Ari Saunders. And that's it for this week's Adult Site Broker Talk. I'd once again like to thank my guest, Terry Stevens. Talk to you again next week on Adult Site Broker Talk. I'm Bruce Friedman.